Hi all, we are getting started. Please come in and sit down. Okay, so uh, my name is Prakash. I am a deep learning scientist at Bank of New... Can't see? Can you hear me? Oh, okay, so my name is Prakash. I'm a deep learning scientist at Bank of New York. Uh, Bank of New York is a very large uh, organization. We have over 50,000 employees. And this was the first innovation center which Bank of New York started, largely working on newer problems in software engineering and many related areas. We now have like multiple innovation centers all over the world. Uh, so given that, a uh, brief uh, introduction of why I think uh, you know deep learning is uh, is such a success at the moment. Uh, one reason is I, I've been working in deep learning for over five years, so I've seen how much it has evolved over the last few years. The first reason is that it has had a few landmark solutions over the last two three years, including things like word embedding. And the second reason is the improvement in infrastructure, which is including things like GPUs uh, and large cloud systems available. The third is the increase in data, because in many areas of work, uh, deep learning, unlike traditional machine learning, used to, is, requires a large amount of data. It does converge to better uh, error reductions, but it requires the data. And the fourth and the last reason, according to me, is the simplification of the solution in the sense, how do you use it? And the methods which we have now are so easy that it's being used by people across multiple domains, including I know a few research doctors in the neurology department in Stanford University who are actually using the deep learning solution. So with that, I'll stop and request Sophia, who is the organizer of this meetup, to introduce all the people who are working. Thank you. We are celebrating 4,000 people this uh, month, which is fantastic. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I see more women showing up. And it's really wonderful. As a woman, I'd like to see more women in the uh, area of AI and deep learning coming. Um, and uh, I would like to thank everyone tonight for coming and also uh, int uh, introduce one of the people that I work with. That's uh, Stephen Colby of Royce Law. He does a lot of um, help to the group in the space of patents. And um, if you want to... So thank you very much. I'm Stephen Colby. I'm the director of the IP group at Royce Law Firm. Uh, we do work for startups, all kinds of work, uh, help with financing, employment. I do IP for people. Um, most importantly, we become friends with our clients and really try to get involved to be as supportive as possible with their startups. Um, and we often support uh, the Silicon Valley Deep Learning Group in their events. And I want to thank Sophia for putting yet another successful event together. And I'm going to let you introduce the panel. Thank you so much. Uh I would like to introduce our fantastic speakers tonight. We have Basim Ventures, Umair Akil. Umair, come and please sit down. We have Vivek Kumar, who uh, works with Dolby, and he's a computer scientist. And we have one of the most um, well-recognized speakers in our group, uh, Stephen Balaban of Lambda Labs, who gathered, gathered huge crowds last, last month for his talk. At, um, in Palo Alto. Stephen, please. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Can you guys hear me all? I'm not sure, so I just want to make sure. Um, first of all, thank you for our gracious hosts, BNY uh, Mellon. Um, and thank you guys for making it out here today on this Monday. Um, the topic today is learning deep learning. <clears throat> and. Before I jump in, I'd want to start with an audience question. How many people in the room, in the audience, are either in the process or have kind of gone through the process of trying to learn what deep learning is? Show of hands. Who's learning deep learning or has learned it? Quite a few people. 
Awesome. So maybe I'll start asking audience questions a lot more, and then we'll just turn it around. Yeah, and definitely. It'll be a quiz. Um, the way this discussion came up was we were at an event together, Vivek and I, and I said, hey, you know, it takes quite a long time to learn, like, all these complexities with deep learning. And he looked at me and said, really? It usually takes two months. We're still debating on what, well, how much time you spend in those two months to learn. But it started this discussion on if you have not been working in this space for a decade, and there's only a few people in the world that have, and now you want to get into deep learning, what is that process? And how do you get into it? What are the hurdles? And how do you think through uh, applying uh, yourself? And what are the resources available? So. Uh, with that kind of construct in mind, maybe um, we can start with both our uh, esteemed uh, colleagues who are going to share their background with us. So if you guys can just maybe start by giving uh, us a flavor of your backgrounds. Uh, Vivek, why don't we start with you? So, background. Uh, ever since I was a child, I was a very curious child, which works very well because I believe all children are born curious. If there's a button, they would want to press it. I have a small kid, so every time there's a button, he would want to press it. But along the way, people grow up and people mature. I refused to do that, which was not very good with my social life, because every time I was trying to take something apart and fix it, fixing was not my strong skill, so that got me into a lot of trouble. And ever since then, since I've gone to school, I've always tried to learn something new. I've tried to experiment with something new, and that kind of followed with my career as well. I started off my career as a double E, circuit board designs, designing circuits for HP, then switched to doing software, which eventually led to me joining a startup where I ended up doing analog, design, analog circuit design for RF, or RF circuit design, which led me to be doing more of a audio design, because guess what, DSP is DSP, RF or audio doesn't make a difference, let's work on it. And then eventually, a couple of years ago, I started doing deep learning, and there, so it's a very cyclical path I've followed, and I think the curiosity to learn, and I always have the mindset, uh, like a beginner's mindset. Zen has a philosophy where they talk about a beginner's mindset having multiple options, and to me, that beginner's mindset, approaching new problems for a unique way helped a lot. And for me, deep learning solved a very interesting problem. It almost democratizes research. It enables people who don't have a very deep domain background to start and look at problems and take, tackle them in a way which gets you almost there, which helps you solve it in a major factor. So that's kind awesome. of been my experience. And so, Stephen, give us a little flavor of your background. And, and how come you, you left your econ major? We were chatting. Both of us are CS econ majors. Uh, that somehow went the CS route. Yeah. Um, so my background is really more along the applied side, almost exclusively within startup companies. And so I started out doing basically comments for face recognition back in 2012 uh, when I started Lambda Labs, and. Face recognition was a, was a really great field to be in when deep learning started out because it was one of the really successful, highly successful early use cases of convolutional neural networks. And so because of that, I, I, I kind of caught this wave early and, and started out doing, doing work with face recognition, mostly using piano. And I was at this company joined this company very early as the first engineer called Perceptio, and we were running convolutional neural networks locally on the mobile phone face recognition. Uh, that company was uh, acquired by Apple, and if you have any of the new iOS 10 updates, I think that some of that technology has been successfully integrated into your iPhone. I'm now the founder of Lambda Labs. We make deep learning training hardware and software. So if you're looking to get started, basically you can buy a dev box from us. We have both one GPU, four GPU, and a rack mounted server. It comes pre-installed with all the frameworks. You plug it in and start training, which is a very different experience than both of us had when we were first starting out, which was, um, you know, you guys have probably had experience of trying to train a network on your MacBook. 
and uh, I'll just say it takes a really long time. Um, and so, yeah, that's a little bit about my, my background. So, given the diversity of both your backgrounds, maybe um, is there something unique about the path you took to get to where you are that you think influences how you think about deep learning? Maybe start again with you, Vivek. So, ma'am, or the process that you took to learn deep learning, coming from like an acoustic and an EE background. Yeah, so if I summarize my background, it's more of a hacker's background. It's more of a hacker's background trying to figure out the shortest way to get to what you want to do. And for me, uh, and by the time I started, like two years ago, there were a lot of libraries available. Tosh was the one I really liked. Which, and there were courses available which really led you to develop a course or read a course and really apply it to solve problems which were very hard to solve before. Uh, so. Two years ago, I started with a, uh, there was a blog post I read about colorizing images. And I was like, how hard could that be? And when I tried to attempt it, it literally took me days uh, to building a network with the tools which were available, and another few days to actually build a bot which takes in black and white images and colorizes them. And this was not a new model. There were, there's already a paper published. But what made it resonate with me was, I do not have an image background, and I know people who have been doing image research, and I've been working on this for years, and me being able to do it, starting from such something like that, as a hacker, it really resonated with me, hey, this is something amazing and exciting here. And then I got on the path is, why is everybody else not doing it? <laughs> like, everybody should learn it, it's easy to learn. What about you, Stephen? Yeah, so I, I, I came at it from a very, uh, one is soft, with a software engineering background, and two is with the mindset of trying to solve a very specific problem. When I got into it, I really wanted to solve the problem of generic face recognition in the wild, which when I first hopped into that in 2012, I thought naively that this might be able to be solvable um, in a couple of years, and it turns out that's actually, in fact, a very difficult problem. And so I, I think that there's there's a few different approaches, you know, so I really have always come in from, I'm trying to solve a specific problem, you know, how do I, how do I uh, teach myself and uh, learn the various tools that I need to, to, to get the problem solved. Um, it's also interesting, I think that the one, one thing that you should, you should take note is the landscape has changed really dramatically uh, over the, since the time I started, also since the time that Vivek started, and even just yeah. the, 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 the two of our times, the, the landscape has changed so dramatically. And it's uh, you know, kind of important to keep that in mind too as you're listening to this and kind of uh, taking our advice is that uh, we learned during a very different era. I'm, I'm going to come to Vivek in a bit because he's got um, sixth on Google. If you say learning, deep learning, one of his answers comes up. But maybe dig in a little bit. When you say the landscape has changed, uh, is it just the frameworks? Is it the resources? Um, is it the people that are trying to attempt deep learning? H how do you kind of see that? There are some problems deep learning has not solved. <laughs> this and conference calling are way up there on the list. This uh, is much better. Yeah. Okay, how's that? Okay. Yeah. We will get there. It doesn't need to be turned on. Uh, okay, so in, in terms of what has and put, changed. And put years to it, I'm sorry. Sure. Yeah, in, in, terms of, in terms of how I see the landscape having changed over the last five years, because note, starting in 2012, the options available to you in terms of deep learning tutorials were one, deeplearning.net by University of Montreal and Theano. Um, the unsupervised feature learning and deep learning, the UFL DL wiki from Stanford University, which was largely a um, MATLAB tutorial set. 
And there was also Torch, but I also, they didn't um, quite have the same uh, tutorial infrastructure as, as uh, either of those two that I mentioned. So that was really pretty much it in terms of the frameworks that were, that were available uh, for doing GPU accelerated machine learning. Since then, I mean, we have CAFE having come out and really taking over production ready GPU systems between, I'd say, uh, what was it, 2013 or 14? Probably end of 2013, early 2014, to um, now TensorFlow and uh, PyTorch has made all this so, so much more accessible. Um, and so I think that it's just really dramatically changed. The community has gotten significantly larger. Um, you know, so I went to NIPS for the first time in 2014. That was already after it had kind of um, just ballooned. Um, and now, I mean, I think it's already maybe doubled a couple more times since then. Venture um, capitalists are showing up now. Right, yeah. And so VCs were not showing up in 2014. I, I think that Mark Zuckerberg showed up in 2013. Uh, and and uh, um, so anyways, the community's gotten much larger. That means that you can now do Google searches, for example, uh, and instead of getting uh, one of those three websites, you'll get answers on various communities. I think that it's really great. It's been very positive because you have a lot of web communities like uh, cross-validated on Stack Overflow and other, other communities where people kind of ask questions and can get their answers posted. <clears throat> Uh, partly because this is a challenge you still face. Do you still see uh, individuals that are trying to learn deep learning run into the platform problems and the data problems? Like, where, where do you go to get the corpus of data to train on? Where do you go to kind of figure out what is worth... Um, uh, how do I get started? You've already named five communities for me. Yeah, so I think that that's actually one of the biggest barriers to entry. Um, so the, the number one barrier to entry that I see when I, when I interact with, with people is they don't buy a GPU. That's, a, that's just a fundamental mistake is that, you know, you're not going to learn this stuff if you are having to set up a deployment job and then wait uh, overnight or have to wait three or four days or even more on your MacBook. That's just not going to work and you should really close that uh, learning cycle for yourself. Just make the investment whether, you know, just, just go on, build, build a machine. So that's one. The second barrier I, I see is after they've, you know, maybe gone through some of these tutorials, run these initial training scripts, you're like, well, how do I adapt this to my own data, right? You know, how do I make my own, you know, I, I want to do it with my own data. I think a lot of people run into that, that second barrier, which is they don't really know how to, how to get the data in the right, uh, you know, a lot of this is just data wrangling. <laughs> And what about the cloud? I mean, right now, I could go on Amazon and get some machines and pay them by the minute. Do you see, uh, maybe an audience question again, how many folks in the room are building and training their own models? So the number already reduced drastically. Um, how many of the smaller number are doing it on a GPU under the desk, nice foot heater, or on the cloud, Amazon heater? So it's, it's an interesting split. So do, do you see more uh, individuals? There's also a third group. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, I'd be curious to see if actually what the numbers are actually. But, um, it's for one out of four, one out of five, I think, uses on the Yeah, but there's also a third group. I think do you also game on that workstation? That was my only reason to get the GPU. <laughs> I'll be honest. I'm like, I can get a gaming rig and a GPU. Um, so... So, so, so let, let me take that question to... Uh... I would also add just, too, in terms of the cloud, I think a lot of people, I mean, you know, he, here's a question. How many people wanted to do some d GPU training on the cloud and then found that they, uh, you know, you, you find it very difficult to, to just system administer a Amazon instance? Anyone? No? Okay, but everyone finds it really AWS easy to experts. use AWS. Mm, that's, yeah. AWS experts. Uh, so, Vivek, I mean... Um, You've put together quite an interesting uh, post on Cora that kind of uh, provides a map of people to learn uh, from fundamentals onward. Maybe take a minute to explain that. Uh, and then I'd love to kind of like dig in a little bit deeper, probably with some more questions from the audience around um, this process of now applying this knowledge to real problems. Because it comes to your point, which is 
even if you've learned the basics, how do you apply it to your data, your problems? And what are you doing in Dolby uh, with deep learning, for instance? Maybe taking it to your own work experience. Yeah, so, I mean, but three questions. So, when I'm learning deep learning, I consider, like, after I got a bit of understanding of it, I consider learning deep learning as cooking. It's easy to learn, really hard to master. So getting started is easy. If you just want to uh, build a model or try to train a model, it's easy to download a model, run it. TensorFlow Proploids is there, you can download something, run it in a matter of hours. I mean, I consider that an equivalent of microwaving a hot dog or microwaving a hot pockets. But then you go further, and there are models you can download, train, uh, there are great tutorials on TensorFlow, or PyTorch, or any of your favorite frameworks. You can go and advance there. It's like building a recipe. You have a whole recipe, you're doing everything from scratch on your GPU server. That's how I had access to a server, luckily. So that's how I did it, and it worked really well. And then you can start customizing applications for your own use. But to really get to dirt of something, you kind of have to find a problem you're worth solving for. You kind of have to understand a domain. I mean, uh, image processing, I would say uh, CS231N from Andre Kapathy is a great, great course to do. If you're focused on it for a few months, that will get you to being an almost a good image processing expert. Same thing with NLP. There's a great uh, 221 course in Stanford, again, really great course where you can start to understand state-of-the-art papers in NLP. You can start to understand what's going on there. And then you can go deep and start solving a problem. But again, finding a problem worth solving for and addressing that and targeting what you're learning to do something and solving a real problem really helps. And so an example maybe, uh, an example or two of what you might be doing in Dolby that is using deep learning or some of the problems your, you, your team is looking at? Unfortunately, I can't explain any specific thing we are currently doing. Fair enough. Uh, but uh, to me, uh, you know, think about problems which have been solved. Uh, speech recognition, speech translation, or the recent problem which I'm really fascinated about, image processing. I mean, that's a problem which, or sorry, image compression. That's a problem where you do not, where there is no dearth of data limitations. There is enough data available because what you want to do is build a network which takes this image, constrains it in some manner, and gives you the same image back. And your goal is to be as close to the original image as possible. So there are problems you can start solving and start attacking, which need not need a lot of data or where data acquisition is easy. Okay, so before I start digging in deeper into some more of the technical challenges and the journey that these guys took, um, any questions from the audience for what we've discussed so far? Like, is there something burning? I'll get the mic over to you. Cool. Uh, so thanks for organizing this. My name is Mohammed Musa. I'm CEO and founder of Deep in AI. We're computer vision AI startup, and my CTO, who has a PhD in AI, actually quit Google to study deep learning because it wasn't hot when he studied it. And when we look at candidates, we get two types. There is uh, the extreme hacker mentality, and there's real scientists. And Shots fired. Shots fired. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's, it's like, uh, and, and I respect both. I'm actually the hacker and my CTO is the real scientist. So it's <laughs> not, not, you know, uh, and you, need, you do need both for a startup, actually. Uh, actually, maybe even more the hackers than the real scientists. But anyways, the, what we've seen in the field is that there is a lot of hackers who can get stuff done and just you know, download papers and go get models from GitHub. But when you, they try to come up with something brand new or something that is really innovative and effective, they just get blocked because they don't understand the math, they don't understand all of the complexities behind it. And that's where my kind of CTO comes in and fills the gap. And we like wonder, and probably you're kind of, uh, but like both of you are more on, uh, like in the middle of both because like you have really good technical background as well as 
hacking mentality and like what are you, what have you seen in the industry? So with with the background, I think deep compare. I mean, it's all in comparison. Compares. So I have a audio processing background, and compared to image processing or signal processing, where doing a master to solve a problem, deep learning is relatively easy. I mean, the fundamental backgrounds you need is linear algebra and calculus. I had the fort I was lucky enough that I learned linear algebra during my high school, so I kind of loved it. So that really helped me to get started. But beyond that, there are not a lot of breakthroughs. And I, I, and I would again go back to my cooking metaphor. The more you do it, the more you'll learn. A lot of it is about experiences, how good you are at it. Because it's easy to build a network. It's very hard to debug a network when it's not working. What do you do? And like a good cook will come and tell you, hey, it's almost fine, just add salt. A good person with a lot of experience can come and tell you, hey, just add a few dropouts and the network will start training. And, and sometimes you need that help, sometimes you need that expertise, sometimes you need that uh, experience, I would say, which comes with it. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I kind of want to, to split the, um, the quote-unquote hacker mentality into two separate classes. Uh, one of those is a very talented software and systems engineer that, you know, understands optimization and can, can write really tight for example, GPU kernels, and has an extremely strong math background, right? Uh, I, and then the other one would be something where it's more just slapping together stuff, you know, in the, in the same way that you would want to split, uh, for example, a really good system software engineer with somebody who uh, can kind of like uh, cobble together stuff from Stack Overflow, but maybe doesn't understand CS fundamentals, and then when a bug happens, they don't really understand and can't like drop down that layer of abstraction. You know, they can't drop down the next layer of abstraction because they don't understand the full stack. Um, so I, I would want to split that hacker me mentality into those two separate things because you do need both of those at the company. You need a really good hacker type and systems, uh, you, know, new, you know, good optimization person. And then you also need a, you know, a really good scientist. Um, oftentimes those are the same people, uh, but sometimes they're, they're not. And um, yeah, I mean, basically I, I completely agree with you, which is when there's a bug, whether it's you're talking about a software system or you're talking about a, mach uh, a statistical machine learning system, if there's a bug and if you don't understand the fundamentals and you don't have those kind of table stakes of a strong math background and you don't understand what's going on, then you're not going to be able to debug the system. Uh, this applies for both, you know, whether it's a software or a machine learning system. Um, so um, in, in, in general, you know, I, I, I think that that's the, I don't have anything else to add really. I'm just going to follow up with two questions. Um, as you were going through your process of learning, uh, what were some of the things that you ran into that were hard for you to wrap your head around? Um, where did you, what were the stumbling blocks that you hit? Like maybe you can give us that story to give us a little bit of like flavor. Uh, yeah, so, um, well, first of all, when I started, it was with, Theano, which is a graph programming model, and so I thought that the uh, the graph programming model was, was a little bit um, is, a, is a more difficult abstraction than, for example, Torch or Cafe. Certainly, um, TensorFlow also has a very similar graph programming model. Although I would say that Theano's is is uh, sorry, James, but worse. Uh, this is James Bergstra is the author. I'm sorry for for calling it worse, but I would say that it's not it's not quite as elegant. Um, and so that was actually a very difficult system, I, I thought, to initially get started with. Um, so that was, that was my, that's my big stumbling block, I'd say. But, you know, eventually you get a friend. Uh, and, and Vivek, for you, wh where did you stumble or, or? So for me, fortunately when I started, there were reasonable, I would say, examples. PyTorch was fitted my hacker mindset where you could run it and get feedback. For me, I mean, as an engineer, we are trained to do standard programming and debug a program. But with deep learning, you end up writing a program which is maybe 100, 200 lines of code, but most of the debugging is making sure your data is correct, you are using data which is not biased, you are using data which is representative of your problem, it's correctly mangled, there's no dirty data, people have labeled things correctly, and that, changing the mindset that it's not a coding problem anymore, it's more about a problem like 
what you're training like a child, you need to make sure you're setting the correct examples for the child. So it's like that. Yeah, I also want to add to, going back to your question about, you know, and also just the yeah. differences between software engineering and machine learning engineering. Um, you have to really do have, you really do need a much more scientific mindset. Because when you're going to set a job and you're going to do a training job overnight, you, that, there needs to be significantly oh, yeah. more, you, you, you can't just bang against the REPL like you might with uh, a typical software engineering problem. You really need to understand what you're doing, have a very thoughtful experiment, and, uh, and be able to both navigate the problem space and, and, and the solution space and understand and be able to come up with valid and uh, you know, testable hypotheses about your problem before you go out and, and do an overnight job or spin up uh, a thousand instances on Amazon. So, so coming back to that question where you have the, the PhD type and the hacker type, um, as you're thinking about growing the team, uh, are there any particular backgrounds you look at? Are there any particular strengths you look at in a team uh, as I'm recruiting or you're recruiting? What, what, is, what are those backgrounds you're looking for? Um, experimental backgrounds in physics and chemistry? Biology? I mean, I mean so give us a flavor of that. We're, we're, we're a small team. We've, we've got, we've got uh, five people. You'll grow. Um, and, but, you know, when, 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 when we are out hiring and when I've been looking at, at people's backgrounds, um, in general, I think that the mathematics is, is definitely table stakes to getting started with this. I mean, you know, when we're talking about learn, learn machine learning in uh, a couple of months or, or whatever it is, right, it's like the mathematics, you definitely need that kind of, you need those prereqs. You can't just, you can't just start, um, I think, so that's one thing. I think that in terms of the, 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 the concrete backgrounds, um, on one hand, I don't want to discourage anyone from getting started. I'm just saying, uh, I mean, to be... Economists cannot learn deep learning. <laughs> it's not true. He's... Um, so uh, definitely a really strong quantitative background, one. Two, I, I really like to see uh, if, if they come from more of an academia background. So we, we've hired people who are... You know, I've hired a postdoc, I've hired someone who is dropping out of their PhD, I've hired people who are software engineers with, um, with, with just bachelor's degrees. And so I've kind of seen a little bit of, uh, we've, we've, we've had to hire the, the whole range. And, you know, each of these have very different, different, different uh, kind of things that you're looking for. Um, but I'd say the quantitative abilities and also just being a good software engineer, I think these are really crucial uh, kind of prereqs. And, and just because you've come back to quantitative abilities a few times, uh, is this the, the mathematical background, do you believe that is where the hackers probably drop off in terms of how far they can go into the system? So, I mean, yes, I think that the the you get a lot of people who might be self-taught in, in, in a certain way and then, and then don't kind of go back and try and study those fundamentals and then they run into roadblocks and then a lot of the, the good ones will actually just realize that, recognize that problem, go back and get those fundamentals and then kind of progress to the next level and some people do get stuck at that. Um, but I think oftentimes, you know, the, the, the exceptionally talented people you'll find almost always are self-taught and they, they understand how to recognize and remove barriers in front of them, you know, in, in their career and learning path. And in defense of the hacker community, I would say hackers tend to... No, nobody's, nobody's attacking the hacker community. It was a fair and balanced question. Fair and balanced <laughs> question. question. Hackers tend to go and understand the system. They go and rip the guts out, usually. But do they put it back together? Sometimes they do. <laughs> um, I'll come to your question in a second. Just uh, one more thing as we're talking about... Um, the topic of hackers and researchers. Um, one of the things that we learned from uh, all the history books on science is, you know, the unexpected insights. Uh, I was trying to solve problem X, but I solved problem Y, which happens to have triggered that light bulb. Um, as, as you are working through various problems um, in the area of deep learning, have you run into this situation where, you know, there was a moment of clarity for you uh, uh, th that, like, you know, the light bulb went off as like, aha, that's what gradient descent is. Simple example, but it took me some time. Mm -hmm. 
Spe especially as you, like you're working on GANs right now. Um, I mean, that's not a simple uh, architecture to think about, to, uh, to reason about, at least for me it's not. Um, or some of the more complex architectures. Did you have that experience or was it just like... I, yeah, I mean, so, so whenever you're learning any new, any, any new topic and, and any new subtopic within a topic and, and any new specific paper, first of all, every single paper you're going to have a, some sort of light bulb moment. Every single, maybe sometimes even a section in a paper, you're going to have a light bulb moment, right? And so there's lots of light bulb moments along the way. I think the more general um, and interesting insights that I've personally come to um, have little to do with some sort of specific thing like you know, GANs or, uh, or, or gradient descent, like the example that you said, but um, I think more along the lines of just the field in general. So for example, you know, so there's one, I was watching this interesting talk from Jeff Hinton, 2007 maybe, and he wow. goes, um, you know, we found this, we had this great insight and found a way to speed up um, the conjugate gradient descent a thousand times, and he was talking about, uh, I think he was talking about conjugate gradient for, um, restricted Boltzmann machines. And he says, well, first of all, we only do one step instead of 10. And then in the 20 years it took me to figure that out, computers got a thousand times faster. And, um, and so I think that that, that specifically, the, the one thing that I've really noticed is uh, a lot of what we do in the field is so compute bound. You know, and, and I, 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 was, um, I was on the, the computer science the Computer History Museum's website, and I saw this uh, brochure for a thinking machine CM2, which is a 2.5 gigaflop com supercomputer that was released in the uh, in the in the early 80s, and I was reading through their brochure, and they were talking about data parallelism, and you know that 30 years ago the systems were literally 40,000 times slower, right? 2.5 giga gigaflops is um, is, is approximately um, 4,000 times less powerful than a 1080 Ti in terms of if you're talking about um, single precision yeah. uh, flops because it's uh, a 1080 Ti is 11.3 teraflops and so about 12 ter teraflops and um, so the point is is that the a huge amount of the progress and a huge amount of the 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 things that are going to be unlocked in the future I think are really bound on the compute and when you have a cell phone that is getting 50 times faster every, every five to 10 years, uh, you know, it unlocks a huge amount of possibility. So that's, that's probably one, one big insight. That, it's not really an insight that I had. It's just something that I've seen other people have, and then I'm just spouting that. I, I, do, I do like when Jeff Hinton says that. He, 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 he has a good point there. What about you, Vivek? I mean, the, the light bulb moment where um, you got a moment of clarity around your process of learning and applying? I don't know if there was a light bulb moment. It was a slow hunch. Uh, most of it was a slow hunch. There was nothing exceptionally which I can recall which was a light bulb moment which suddenly clicked. It was, seemed to work. And I think I did come at a different time than you did because when I came there was a lot of support from the community. And the community is great, and I've, I've worked in the open source community before, I mean, the Linux community before. In the Linux community, when you ask questions, you were, you used to be a little cautious because you didn't want to ask all the noob questions. But in this community, it's great. Everybody helps. When people publish papers, they, they publish their code along with it. It's all reproducible result. You can easily reach out to the authors. They reply back and help you. They make the data sets available. So it really is uh, interesting as to how easy it was to get started. I think that was my insight, that it's incredibly easy, or it's reasonably easy to get started. All right, so uh, before I jump into a few more questions, I had there was a question in the audience. I'll come to you. Thank you. Hi, uh, first, uh, thank you for organizing this uh, very useful you know, uh, section, yeah. Mm. My question is about you know uh, GPU because I know you know deep learning is uh, compute power is very important for deep learning, right? And I look like your company you know making you know uh, kind of uh, using GPU to set up kind of a server, right? Powerful you know supercomputer, yeah. So what's your you know price? 
do you use uh, NVIDIA GPU, you know, right? What, what's the price? Because for the individual, you know, uh, the learner, right? Also small star company, they will be have difficult to buy those hardware, right? You know, especially for M NVIDIA, it's, it's expensive, but usually in the beginning, they will not sell to the individual, you know, user. So, so I would like to know your company's offering, yeah. What's the price, yeah? Uh, yeah, and uh, so if, if you're curious, you can first of all just go online and search for Lambda Labs, and you can we have an entire brochure online. But um, I get to to take go to, to go back and say kind of well, um, you know, is it out of reach for the average startup company or the average individual? I think the answer is no, right? I mean, uh, realistically speaking, um, if if you're strapped for cash, you should just go and you should go online, go on Craigslist, buy a bunch of used parts, and put a computer together. And or or buy a, a used a used gaming rig, and I think that you can get started. If you just have one GPU, you're going to be in a much better situation than trying to train something on a laptop or even to train something on a desktop CPU. It's just you know that's one thing. So I I don't think it's financially out of reach for for anybody, um, especially if your if your time's valuable. Um, and so then in terms of in terms of the price, I mean, you know, for example, our our, our starting stuff is, you know, our, our lowest one GPU item is is twenty six hundred dollars for a new unit. It goes up to for our rack mount servers with eight GPUs, you know, eighteen thousand dollars. If you want to build a data center out, uh, millions to tens of millions of dollars. Um, but but it just depends on what scale. It's it's not cheap. Um all right, so the final question before uh, we turn it over to the audience for more questions is, um, is there a next in deep learning? What's next after deep learning? I think we have a long way to go. I think we, we barely scratched the surface. I mean, if you think about once we started, even though the theory has been around forever, but once we started getting results, it was when Alex Krasinski was able to train the network and was able to beach the ImageNet competition in 2012. And since then, we have learned a lot, applied it to new domains, but think about natural language understanding. We still don't really fully understand that. We, we barely understand unsupervised learning. We barely understand single shot learning. I mean, there are a few papers out there, but it's not something which has become accepted. So I think there's a long way to go, even in deep learning itself, but Maybe there is more cognitive-based algorithms out there, but I'm not looking into that right now. Stephen, what do you think? Yeah, I, I think that there's still a huge amount that, that we don't know and that the field is learning. Um, so I think that, to be honest, I think this is really just the beginning. I think that we're uh, on the adoption curve still quite early. Where we're while it, it does certainly feel really crazy right now um, and, and very hype, hype driven from somebody who's been in it since 2012, um, I would say that we're still just still very, very early on here. And in terms of like, quote, what's next, right? I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to take a very conservative stance and just say, I think that it's probably going to be very similar uh, models with just uh, compute that is tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of times more powerful and you're going to see quite a bit of, of progress in a lot of these, un, you know, uh, uncracked problems. I mean, you know, when you just have so much compute power, I think that uh, applying it to a huge amount of data, which we already have, and a huge amount of compute to be able to process that data, um, I think that you're going to see some more interesting stuff. Any like, particular domains that you guys are excited about? Personally, for me, natural language is this massive domain where conversational systems, in my mind, uh, really change how we work with computers. For me, how deep learning will work with language, especially with the Stanford course, I got more and more excited about it. Uh, any particular domains that you are keeping an eye on or you feel uh, have a lot of interesting research and or ideas? Natural language processing, natural language understanding, I mean, or bigger picture how humans engage with computers. Because currently, regardless of the press, most of the systems which are being built are being built to work with humans. And the interface with humans, I think, is the more less understood part of it. The technology is easy, it's democratized. A lot of people can apply it, but how it gets applied, how does human behave with it, how, when do you transition, what are the transition points? Uh, may not be a pure deep learning problem, but that's something which kind of excites me and uh, 
something I think about. So I'm personally very interested in uh, the creative applications of artificial intelligence. Um, I'm very interested in kind of some of the, the more recent results with um, pixel, pixel recurrent neural networks as well as GANs. Yeah. And um, in general, I guess you'd say encoder decoder architectures, kind of similar to the style, like uh, feedboard style transfer and style transfer um, methods. And I just think that there's a lot of opportunity there in terms of, I'm, I'm sure we've all, you, you guys have probably all seen, you know, both Deep Dream as well as, um, you know, these kind of artistic style transfer uh, algorithms. And if you haven't, you should just go search online for neural style transfer because it's, it's very interesting. And I think that there's, there's, a lot of, um, there's a lot of promising uh, things in that, you know, down that rabbit hole. I think that there's, to be honest, though, I, I think that every field that I learn more about is, is more and more interesting. That's just something I'm personally interested in. All right. So um, we'll turn it over to some questions. Um, questions over there. Sorry to make you run. Um, so I'm not a practitioner in this domain, but have been sort of dabbling to understand it. My sense is, you know, unless you're an academic, you're not going to innovate or build innovation around core algorithms. And you're really, uh, data is going to be a prerequisite, but not a guarantee of success or innovation. And the part that I'm, I'm curious about is what you're seeing in trends around building systems where you gather the data you need, and more importantly, label and uh, tag the data you need in order to drive these systems. Because my sense is, for systems to get to scale, that's actually what's going to drive a lot of it, is having that kind of labeled data. And the trick is, how do you do that without you know, paying a whole bunch of people to label it in advance? So game mechanics, games with a purpose, things like that. Are you seeing that, or is that completely outside your domain of what you're f focusing on? We're kind of seeing that. Some of the ways we have worked around the system or the data system is redefining the problem. Uh, and a lot of times you can start redefining the problem in a way where you start getting a lot of data or you can use some of the synthetic data to help augment your system. Uh, one example would be, say, uh, speech to text. Uh, one of the models which came out of Baidu was the deep speech model. And what they used uh, was a CDC system, which meant that with their speech-to-text translation, they didn't need to annotize each uh, synonym or each uh, character, but they could use unaligned data with speech or unaligned text with speech to train the system. And with that, if you look at uh, all the podcasts or all the places where you have unaligned text-to-speech, you can start solving the problem. So a lot of times when you redefine the problem in a way where uh, you can either uh, get a lot of data, it helps. The other thing is transfer learning. Try to find a problem which has been solved before using similar methods and retrain them uh, with just your add-on. Uh, I've seen a lot of people use GANs to generate data and augment it. Have you? seen that or have you worked with that? Um, in terms of augmenting data sets, uh, I have not, I've, I, I've never, I've never tried that myself. It, but uh, I mean, to some extent, if you think about it, um, right, I mean, it's, I'm trying to, I mean, basically, you know, if you think about it from a theoretical perspective, the GAN is like trying to push up uncommon, you know, basically, um, if it's an energy function, it's trying to ma ma basically uh, find those spots that are that are uh, kind of easily confused by the, you know, to find, it's trying to find the spots that are gonna easily confuse the, the discriminator. And um, the discriminator is gonna wanna make those basically less likely. So um, in some sense that is kind of augmenting a data set. It's like dynamically creating mm -hmm. a data set if you think about it that way. Um, and it, really the, the, the generative part of the GAN is, is actually defining a function that generates a, a, di a data set for you if you think about it that way. Um, but um, in terms of augmenting data sets, I, I, haven't, see, I haven't seen that, personally. Um. Well, I'm starting to see a lot of GANs being used in, in that way where you, you essentially can stream in a lot of data, whether it's visual or whatever it is, and 
by using the discriminator against the generator, you develop an internal representation of the data, sort of a Bayesian clustering sort of model, which after you've done training that up, you can put some supervised layers on top of that um, and use sort of a transfer learning sort of philosophy. But the, the, the thing is, you can get massive amounts of unlabeled data and use that to train up the basic abstractions <laughs> inside and then you need far less data to train up a few layers of supervised uh -huh. learning, that's the expensive data, because that's labeled, and you gotta get that right. So that can really reduce the amount of data that you need, uh, that's the, the expense of the labeled data. Yeah, so I, I mean, I guess to, to rephrase a little bit about what you, what you said, just so I understand and we're on the same page, um, you're basically saying, you know, take the, the discriminator that's been trained with the GAN and use that discriminator's internal representation a, a, as basically a starting point or, or a starting yeah. kind of uh, more disentangled feature space that you can then easily, more easily classify. Um, and so that's, that's kind of, that, that's, that's interesting. I, I'm, I'm, have you, I, I haven't read any papers that have, uh, that have specifically done that. Have you, I, I'm not, so please send me some because I'd like to see what the, what the results are of, of that. Uh, but that does seem like a, from a theoretical perspective, a sound uh, way to, to go about uh, uh, using a GAN to kind of bootstrap a, mm -hmm. uh, a representation. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it sounds very similar to the kind of um, uh, unsupervised pre-training that you that you actually started you, you saw in the, like the kind of 2008 2009 era where you'd have like unsupervised pre-training uh, with like stack denoising autoencoders and then using that learned unsupervised pre-trained representation to then um, do a supervised fine tuning of. Uh, great questions. I think following up on both points, uh, so we're dealing with autonomous driving data and where using GANs and, and, and having a mix of supervised and unsupervised can actually cause the network to trip up on some generated details in the middle of the layers where it, it, it can cause life or death situations, right? So like when reliability is an issue and, and it has safety implications, labeling becomes the bottleneck. That's actually why we switched our company to become a labeling provider using AI and a mix of humans in the process. Uh, and kind of that's the kind of the insight as we did more and more, we saw that the, the neural networks and the innovation in the architectures and you know, RCNNs and all of the, and faster RCNN and, and all of these different models, there is a lot you can do, but the data dependency is so critical. Like transfer learning is one of the best things that ever happened on earth. And we use a lot of it, but at the bottom, when you're dealing with things that require, require predictability and certainty and, and have functional safety verification and qualification, you cannot mess with the data. <laughs> and, uh, and, and you know, I would love to hear your thoughts on that. I'm sorry, can, can, you, can you just re rephrase that to a shorter question? Yeah, so uh, essentially if, if you're if a few pixels can cause semantic segmentation to trip up, then, then using any of these techniques, whether it's GANs or uh, generating auto data, and we saw a lot of people who use like 3D game engines to, to do photorealistic rendering and, and generate a lot of fake data that can just reduce the amount of data that you need to, to train up the model. Uh, we've seen that with semantic segmentation specifically, it doesn't work. Uh, for classification, you can get it to do a great job. You know, bounding boxes, we have people who can do MATLAB scripts to do that. That's, that's not, not a problem. But when it comes to pixel level accuracy with, uh, with noisy data sets, so like point cloud data from LIDARs is freaking noisy. And, yeah. and, and you need a lot of precision to enable to, to solve it. Okay. So that's a statement, though. I'm, is it, do you have a question? Or, uh, yeah, yeah, so <laughs> my question is, like, when, when precision is, is an absolute requirement, what are your recommendations or what you've seen around I see, okay, okay. okay. So, so, so the question models. is, when, when um, you know, either a false positive or a false negative 
uh, have an extremely high business cost? Um, you know, what are the recommendations for um, making those types of failures less likely? Um, it's a good question, and that's you know, it's it's a very you know important problem, especially if, for example, um, your false uh, negative is. Uh, detecting a person walking across the street and your self-driving car, for example, where those have extremely high business costs, um, and you know what are the what are the techniques that you can do to 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 fix those? Um, hmm. It's a very good question. I don't really, uh, yeah, I don't I don't really have any good answers for you because uh, I, you know that's a <laughs> yeah. As somebody who spends a lot of time looking at investments in the self-driving space, that answer is worth a few billion dollars because yeah. no car company wants to put their label on a mobility service without having that figured out. So the fact that we don't have self-driving cars um, is because the cost of a mistake can be rather large. Um, we have time for one last question. Anybody else with a burning question? All right. Um, this is not a question. This is a shameless plug here. Um, so I'm currently a software engineer at Facebook, and I've started a couple weeks ago um, a learnings club um, about deep learning. Uh, so personally, I've been reading a couple papers from uh, various Google Brain and uh, DeepMind and OpenAI and folks, and I find it really difficult to absorb the information on my own. Learning on your own is very, very hard. So if you guys are interested, um, mm -hmm. I started a community up in San Francisco called uh, Deep Learners Club. And what we do is uh, have a group of people um, from software engineers from Facebook, Google, and Airbnb. We gather and um, talk about questions that we have about, uh, you know, each week we assign two papers to read and we gather and talk about questions and teach each other uh, to learn deep learning. So if you're interested, it's uh, deeplearners.herokuapp.com. And I'll be staying afterwards. So if you guys are interested, come talk to me. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yes, exactly. So uh, let's let's thank the speakers one more time. Uh, and 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 also our host, uh, the Bank of New York Mellon. Um, and yeah. yeah. Thank you, sir. Yeah. And uh, yes, so, so my name is Chris. Uh, I occasionally assist Sophia in, in organizing these events. Um, if you have any, any ideas for future events or suggestions for people you think we might be able to convince to speak, please come see one of us and please keep coming to the events. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, on behalf of Bank of New York, I wish to thank the speakers and thank you all for coming for the event. Thank you.